Hello, Michelle. Welcome to the Creative Insider podcast. Thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Thanks for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and to be able to talk to you about uh, a couple of things that have been happening around the world and how it affects the, the, the way we do things. No? So uh, ha- happy to be here. Yeah, me too. I, I wanted to, to share with you, I discovered your work uh, in 2017 around the opening of the Photo Boca because I don't, I mean, that was the time where I was entering architecture in more professional level. And I don't know, I had the feeling that that was the project that really, really uh, made your work worldwide, very renowned. It was everywhere. This project was um, everywhere. And I've been reading a little bit about um, your background and I've seen you've done some, uh, I think a TED talk, I think, um, many different conferences and uh, the more I discovered about your background, I was very interesting to get to know you not only as an architect, but as a person. Um, So there there are these titles of uh, star architect. I would say you're the rock star architect because in your your younghood, you were a a drummer, right? In In a band that was quite popular in Mexico. Oh yeah, I mean, thanks for that, that intro. Uh, yeah, I mean, I started off uh, at a very early stage. I was signed with Virgin Records at uh, age 18, 19 maximum. So it was interesting to to be uh, playing in a band where I didn't know where actually if music was going to take me to a different place or architecture. No, I, I had have. I mean, I have the the fortune of having an amazing mother who even though I was signed with Virgin Records, uh, she told me, you should keep on studying your career because you never know what's going to happen in the future. So it's good to have a, a thing parallel to what you're doing just, just in case, no? So um, I, I, I thought it was a very clever idea what she said, and I did it until there came a point where I couldn't do both things, no? At the beginning, of course, you're a student and you can put the extra hours in, and I was going on tour and then coming back and then uh, presenting my work. And um, and at the beginning, I mean, uh, there's a couple of things that I want to highlight. One was that um, I I really didn't know too well when I started studying architecture if I would that was going to be my passion. I, I just went in because it was a suggestion of, of my brother, my older brother. He said, "Oh, you like arts and graphic design, and you like uh, creative things. Why don't you study architecture?" So I started studying architecture, but I have to confess that I actually fell in love with architecture when I was touring with my band when I was actually on tour and arriving in different cities, different airports, different venues, different um, parks, different places to gather, different bars, different people. That's where I realized the power of architecture and not only the power within its buildings, but the power of the, the spaces that make up the cities for the citizens, no? the spaces where we gather. And that really started influencing and, and making me appreciate much more the idea of, of, of architecture, no? And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I played for four albums, uh, uh, tried to maintain architecture and, and, and music at the same time, but there came a point where a, a client of mine uh, or, or a client that suddenly called me up and he said, oh, where is your office? Because I'm looking for you to design my house. And I didn't have an office. I had a computer where I was uh, on, the, on the tour buses uh, doing my things and, and so I was pretty overwhelmed when this guy told me that he wanted to do a house. And I said, perfect. That's the, that, that's the cue to start the, the, the more formal office. No? Because, I mean, I was doing uh, a refurbishment of an apartment uh, of a friend of mine. And I was doing these other things. And, and it was interesting and it was fun. But it was, I was kind of uh, not seen as a, as a very serious thing until this client said, I want you to design my house. And that's where I, I said, okay, I mean... I had enough of uh, the music industry for that, that amount of time. I, I, again, we cut four albums. We had videos on MTV, Georgia, and it, it was fun. But I have to admit that it was fun for a certain period of time. And then I just wanted to explore myself now as an architect. No? But yeah, you can say that because I had this musical profession at the beginning of my career, uh, being a drummer, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you could say rock star could be the right word, even though... People understand today being a rock star is a very different thing, no? but uh, but yeah. 
No, for me, the most remarkable thing, uh, and I think your, your mother, it's a, it's a wise woman, but uh, also you were wise enough to listen to her because, I mean, when, when you're young and uh, you have this uh, level of success, I mean, uh, Mexico is a huge country, so uh, being, a, being a band in Mexico, it's already a remarkable success for, for somebody younger. It can lead you to take different paths that are more related to the rock star <laughs> instead of uh, studying architecture. Um, and, I, and I'm wondering, yeah. um, how were you seen by your teachers and where, you, where did you study architecture? Because it's also architecture is not, um, I always like to say, it's not like reading a book and then you learn what is in the book and then you go to an exam. It's creative work, which it's never linear and it takes a lot of time. And um, how, how was that period of time while you were studying, uh, touring and your teachers, did they see you like something? Uh, it's like they were like not getting you serious or were they like happy that somebody like you, it's, it's doing it. No, I, I think that first of all, they, they were at the beginning, they were happy. No, they were like excited, like, Oh, this is great. I'm seeing that you're playing with your band and, and you're trying it out. But then I had a couple of, of really, uh, really bad teachers in the sense that they, they started seeing me on, on TV because we were doing TV shows and we were doing, they, our videos were already in uh, heavy rotations in Latin MTV. And they would, they would come to me like, uh, you're not going to be an architect, so don't waste my time. I'm already seeing you in TV playing drums, so you should get out of the career and drop off. And, uh, and I would be like, why? I mean, judge me if I have the talent to be an architect. Judge me if I can present my project. Don't judge me because I'm doing some other thing that you might not appreciate, no? But um, that, that eventually gave me the strength to keep on going, no? Because I was very stubborn. It's like, don't tell me that I can't be an architect, no? And, uh, and then it's funny because, of course, when I, when I finished architecture and started doing my projects, I, I came back to teach at uh, Universidad Iberoamericana, the National University Iberoamericana, which is where I studied. And, um, and I came back to teach there. And when I saw my, the teachers that at the beginning had said that, they, were, they would come back and say, Oh, I knew you were going to be a successful architect. I'm like, <laughs> no, you didn't. You know, don't be, don't be a liar. And um, but it was, it was, it was fun to come back. I, I also have to uh, acknowledge that I also, I mean, I had amazing teachers as well. No, but teachers that that helped me push uh, through difficult times of, of because, of course, because I was touring, I couldn't have uh, as much time as my colleagues. So I ended up overlapping with other generations of, of architects, no? So I didn't finish uh, in my school year with my, with my um, classmates. I finished a little bit later. And, uh, and, and I had some amazing teachers. And, uh, but, but the other interesting thing on the professional side was because I was already touring with my band and earning money with, with the music, I also had the chance, uh, Georgie, to start doing architecture the way I wanted to do architecture. So I didn't have to open up an office and figure out how to pay the bills. I had the money to tell my friends, oh, let me design for you your refurbishment of your apartment. I won't charge for you, but, but please spend the money on good quality of things and, and, and stuff. So I ended up trading kind of uh, having money coming from, from the, the, the musical industry uh, to, to finance the architecture that I wanted to design and not compromise some other architecture that I didn't want to do uh, just for the sake of doing it, no? Or for the sake of maintaining an office. Yeah, I think that's very, very crucial, like to have this kind of freedom in the beginning, especially for um, for an office that does the work like the ones that you do, that it's more like out of the, um, out of the box, so to say. And it's not the, the classic things that we, we see m most of the time. And... Um, so you you mentioned you you have had um you you were very stubborn into into pursuing this um this architectural career and I'm curious um what was the process in the beginning hands on did you uh, need to like end up a concert and prepare the project for your next uh, university presentation or did you because also you were traveling a lot so I guess that you couldn't attend all the lessons and all the classes <laughs> so a lot of uh, no sleep uh, overnight shifts, I guess. 
No, de definitely. I mean, I, 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 I have never slept too much. Jury, I sleep like four hours a day, maximum five. But um, I have to confess also that that was very interesting um, because the if I was working, for instance, sketching on something, an idea as an architect, there would come a point where, where you know, that, those moments where you can't advance anymore. You're stuck and you're stuck and you're stuck. So I would leave the drawing and get on the bus, go on tour, and maybe be at the middle of a song and just get the idea of how I needed to do the drawing. So I would be like, give me a napkin, somebody give me a napkin. And I would just grab a piece of paper and sketch between songs the ideas that I knew I needed to put in the architecture, no? So that made it very interesting because I also talk about a, a, um, the, a, a frustration period that can happen in any of your, of your jobs, no? So you can, you can easily be frustrated as an architect because you don't have a client. You can easily be frustrated as a musician if the uh, industry is not, if, if the radio stations are not playing your songs. So the, the, the beautiful thing about having both was if the music industry was not being um, uh, supportive of what we were doing, instead of just being sad or upset, I would go to the architecture and design buildings or design projects that I would be doing. And if something happened to the architecture, I would have the escape to go on the tour bus and just go on tour and play. So there was a, it was a very interesting way of, of balancing not being uh, upset about things that were happening or not happening with your career back in the times, no? And, uh, and are the skills into making music somehow transferable into making architecture in, in anyhow in the process? Well, I would have to say that it's a, it's a process of awareness. It's a process of, of being sharp enough to have the ideas come to you, no? So that clarity, that's why, that's why I run. I'm also a runner, and I love running in the mornings. And, and because running gives me the clarity of, of consciousness to be, to be able to receive, a, um, I mean, to be, to be more in sync with what you're doing and to have clarity, again, either a, an output for either music or for architecture. But, uh, but I believe it, it really worked in the same way, no? That um, music, um, you're sitting on stage with a, with a group of friends and you have to synchronize what you're doing. But as an architect, even though you design a project, it's also a collaborative uh, 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 career. Um, you depend a lot on, uh, on your consultants. You depend on the team to be able to carry out your ideas. So um, that's why for me, and, and we'll, we'll come back to that, but Foro Boca, um, has been a, a great project personally because it, it mixes the music with the architecture. It mixes my, my two passions, no? Uh, so being able to design a stage where people are going to perform and a theater where people are going to see a concert, that, that's, that's uh, incredible. But it, but it was a, a very interesting process to a point that when I stopped doing music, uh, Georgie, I, had, I, I felt a certain emptiness or a certain loss of something that I went to study film in New York. So I took a course in film in NYU and um, just to put some other stuff in my head. I, I, I've always been a, obsessed about not only talking about architecture. I hate a, when we're with colleagues that it becomes this monothematic a, dinner that everybody talks about their projects and blah, blah. I'm, I'm more interested in life. I'm more interested in how, how have you changed throughout the design of your projects, no? What has happened with you personally in your career, with your friendships and with your families, no? And, uh, and so on. So I think that a, a broader conversation or, or at least uh, most of my friends here in Mexico, they're um, either some of them are fashion designers or they're filmmakers or they're writers. And I love hanging out with them because it's not just architects talking about their projects, no? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. That's why, like, uh, when I was making the podcast, when I was starting it, I, I made a creative insider, not the architectural insider, because also I didn't want to know only about architecture. And because I believe that when you communicate with other creatives from other fields, you can learn something about their process that might be somehow 
applicable into your process and 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 it will be a completely different point of view and and also i think also i mean if people are following you on instagram they can see that you have also this um I, mauro porcini your friend was also on the podcast i call it the um, little great gatsby new york uh, new york crew that it's out of all these <laughs> designers uh you you gather together and it's uh really really fun to to see also how the world is very small because everybody somehow interacts with each other um and you're you're also half american or something like that. i think you, in some of the talks i've listened up from you you said that you have also an american passport right no 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 i mean i i i grew up in mexico born and raised in mexico city so i'm i'm i i um, Uh, but went to live to New York when I was five years old. So I lived in the, in the States when I was five years old uh, until eight years old and then came back to Mexico and, um, and spent my life here. So no, 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 I don't have a, a, an American passport. No, uh, proud to be Mexican, living in Mexico. <laughs> and, uh, and funny what you were saying about the creative uh, aspect, because uh, the only book that I have, Georgie, about my work is a transcription, a transcribe of the lecture that I did uh, back in the days called um, um, overstimulation. And the whole idea that I didn't want to do a book about my work was that I wanted to do a book about sharing a creative process. And the book is called Overstimulation and it's divided into three chapters, which is, uh, the talk is about like in this overstimulated world, what do we pay attention to? So it's attention selection and adaptation. So it's like in this overstimulated world, we pay attention to certain things in our lives, we select them, and then we adapt them to our process. So the book shows a couple of examples of architecture, but at the end of the day, you can talk about the process in any field, uh, in any creative field. So um, yeah, I also believe, and I also enjoy more speaking to friends like Mauro, who's not an architect, that he works with, uh, in this other creative field. And, and we talk a lot about the uh, different designs. Another really good friend of mine is, And Stefan Sagmeister, who's, who's uh, an amazing creative uh, character that I love uh, hanging out while I was living in New York. So when I was living in New York, they were like my, I would, I would call them the, 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 the family there, no? La mafia, la familia italiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's, it's, um, it's fun to see. And I saw you've, you've been to the, to the Super Bowl this year. How was that experience? Because uh, it was so weird to, to, to see Mauro and you in pictures. And, and I was thinking, God damn, these people are coming to my podcast and they're watching the Super Bowl. Everybody talking about it. <laughs> Debbie also. Yeah, Debbie, uh, Debbie Millman was also on the show. Uh, Debbie's amazing. I mean, Ma Mauro has this amazing group of, um, he's, a, he's an incredible networker, no? And uh, we, I've been fortunate enough to be friends with him for a while. And, um, and also he's been generous enough to invite us to the Super Bowl. So normally, I don't know if I would go. I go because, because it's with him and, uh, and uh, this amazing group of people that we have. We have a lot of fun. I mean, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 it was great. The stadium, the, the halftime show and everything. but. Uh, But to me, it's always more about the people that you hang out. And Debbie was there. And then we had an amazing time and, and a lot of great conversations no? while you're at the Super Bowl. But yeah, a, a really incredible experience. Yeah, I, I love this um, quote from Into the Wild. Uh, uh, um, how does it say in the end? Um, Happiness is only when it's shared, right? So if, if you do it just for the matter of doing it without sharing with the, with the right people, it's, it's not going to be... It's not going to be as nice as as it when it's shared. Um, and so you mentioned before the first project you got is is this house for for your friend. Um, and how did it? Uh, so in the beginning you were only you designing. Uh, how did the the office take off in the beginning? Because as I, as as I see from from your website, if this is the PR thirty four house that was the first project that's around early. 2000s how did it develop from there well hey, hey, as i mentioned I, i mean first of all yes let, let me just reinforce that happiness is, is best what shared definitely that's the story of my life I'm, i've been uh, coming out of music georgia i think that one of the most powerful tools was uh, collaborations no and collaborating with other fellow musicians that you're a drummer but you want to play with the bass guitar player and you want to and so When I came to architecture, I wanted to collaborate. I wanted to collaborate with 
graphic designers and industrial designers and other architects. And it took me a while to understand that this was a very jealous field because back in the days, architects would not collaborate. They would be like totally independent and, and hiding their projects and their work from each other, no? So I started trying to open up um, a profession where it was more about if we collaborate, we learn from each other and we grow faster, no? So that was a very kind of important point in my career or, or, or has been a very important process eh, throughout the work that we do today. Eh, not only the way we collaborate, but what we can do for the communities that we're working in. So coming back to your question about how I started, um, yeah, I mean, I started on my own and I, of course, eh, started working for this client that I did his house and then another one and then eh, was fortunate enough to meet two eh, incredible people. One is um, Isaac Broid and the other is Miquel Adria. Isaac Broid is part of the Mexican generation that reintroduced modern architecture to Mexico. So when schools was, were already, were only teaching Barragan and Legorreta and Mexico is colors and it's very playful. It's very, they came back saying yes, but it's also very modern. No, So it was this generation of Alberto Calach, Enrique Norton, um, Alvin, and Broid. And um, Broid was already working a project with Miquel. Miquel uh, runs Arquine magazine in Mexico. He's, he's an architect from Spain who came to Mexico, but, but an incredible editor, an incredible writer, an incredible architectural critic. So we teamed up and we partnered for three years. And I say I was very lucky because... I was the youngest one, so immediately when I was working with them as a partner, I was introduced to an older generation of architects in Mexico, no? like Teodoro González de León and uh, these other uh, older architects. So immediately I, I kind of was in, play, uh, in the place of uh, being at the right place at the right time with these uh, older architects um, talking about the future of Mexico and city planning and, and all the other incredible stuff that you would love to hear when you're a young architect. So. It, we did that for three years, and, it's, and, and exactly um, there came a point where I, I thought that I could explore more and I could experiment more, no? and, and um, I didn't want to have my two partners, in this case, Isaac and Mikel, um, go through the path that I, that I wanted to design. So I said, why don't we leave it here? Let's, let's break up the firm. Let's each of us do uh, what we want to do because I wanted to explore more. And uh, the first house that, I, that came out of my idea of exploration was a PR34 house, the ballerina house, because I didn't want to, I remember sitting down with, my, with, with Mikel and, and Isaac. And it's not that, I mean, the, even the, the way that they, had, that, that they would design was, was uh, already too known for them and too safe for me in many ways. No, I wanted to explore geometry. I wanted to explore materiality. I wanted to explore crafts. So the moment we, we decided to split up, my first project was the, the PR34 house, which was it's a house made entirely of steel. No? I mean, it has the, the insides and you have wood on the inside, but it was a very experimental house back in the days that not even the construction workers that were doing the regular architecture here in Mexico understood how to build. So we, had to, we ended up hiring uh, metal workers that would work in, in, in car wrecks or, or, or they would repair cars to try to do this seamless uh, metal shell on the outside. No? And that, that kind of ignited my career as, a, a, again, coming back to being on my own again after those three years with, with Isaac and, and with Miquel. No? But was that the, the house that you mentioned that you didn't, uh, for example, charge for, for the project just for the matter of creating something new in, a in order to allow your client to invest more money into actually the building of something different than, uh, than, um, than the usual? Or was an earlier stage when that happened? No, that was an earlier stage when that happened. So when I, when I got to do the PR34 house, I already, of course, I had my full full on architecture. I didn't work as a musician anymore. And, um, and I could explore more with the client, but yeah, that, that by that time I was already a, a full on architectural office on my own. <laughs> and I, I'm, 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 I've been curious always to ask people like you that, and I'm, 
I've been following your work. I mean, I, I discovered you when I was a, stud, a, a student still. So for me, when I discover a new architect, when I was a st student, I would uh, not stay on the on the surface. I would be sort of this online stalker, you know, and go back in in uh, the work and see and find connections. Um, and I saw also you have collaborated on one project with Björk Ingels in, in that period of time. And I'm curious, um, in the in the um, design approach, um, because also you are not only the designer, but you're also an entrepreneur and a manager of a studio. Um, how much hands-on are you? Like, are you more like the mind of design? Because also on your Instagram account, there are a lot of sketches you do. And um, then more your team support uh, than with the actual then detailing and realizing all the 3D models and things. Or were you in the beginning or do you have a knowledge of everything and now you delegate because just you don't have the time? Well, it, it, it's interesting to, to, to understand that process. Of course, I started as every architect where you design, do the 3D, do the physical model, go to the site, supervise the construction. So... So I think that you have to pass through that to understand what you're talking about, to understand how to do things. Then I explored the typical office. And by, by meaning typical office is that I, I, the biggest it was, it got to be like 55 people in my office. And I found the scale not to be too comfortable enough. Um, uh, I didn't want to grow. I mean, I, of course, I have friends like Bjarke who has a 700 people office and I have other friends that, that have different scales of offices, but I, I did, I started to feel that I wanted to have a smaller team. So it's interesting because even before the pandemic, and I have to say this was maybe around six years ago, uh, Georgie, that uh, I decided to, well, I, I started noticing a pattern. I had really talented people that went out of my office to do their work. And when they went out because they had one commission, uh, they didn't have more work. So they wanted to shut down their offices and come back and work with me. And at that point I said, you know what? Don't close your office. Keep your office and let me work with your office as a satellite office. So I tried to challenge a, a couple of different things. First of all, uh, architects in the past did not talk about collaborations. They, they always had associates, but they always would give them the last credits. No, You would see the list of all the people involved in the project and it would be the last ones in the credits. And I said, well, this needs to change because if you're collaborating, you should have an upfront collaboration, something horizontal where you give somebody the opportunity to be parallel to your name in the credits, but also to understand the responsibility of that, but also make a little, a little more money than he would do on his own. So I decided to downsize to four people as a core a model within my office where we do all the design intent, but we have a satellite of maybe seven to eight offices that we're doing projects with. Most of them are my ex-employees that now are independent, and I give them the credit to say, eh, yes, this is a Rojkin Arquitectos project with Amasa, which is one of the offices. So it, it's been working amazingly because it's like a, you have a project manager on steroids because they... they they, because they have their name on the project, they're not going to let you down. They want to have their name be there. They want to fight for the project. And they're, they're getting commissions that maybe they wouldn't get because their offices are smaller offices, no? And um, uh, one other really key component of doing work like that is that uh, we share information. My, 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 my four people core team becomes this kind of central hub of sharing if somebody knows how uh, there's a new contract that is better than, than the rest of the teams have a contract, I would share with them. If, if somebody knows a new software that, that we could start using. So it's kind of an open source collective way of making sure that there's younger offices learning the process even sooner. And I learn from, from these collaborations as well because most of the, the teams I know, and there's some young offices now coming to us saying like, can I be one of your, your collaborators? I would love to collaborate with you guys. So we're testing out new offices all the time. And that, that, that maintains kind of this fresh approach to doing stuff. So, so coming back to your main question is we centralize the design in the office, but then we collaborate with other offices around the world, which is, has been great. And it looks, it looks more like a post-pandemic model, but it actually was not planned 
with the pandemic. It was planned before the pandemic, no? Yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of the it's funny how a lot of these more avant-garde practices were really like uh uh, in their own uh, waters when the pandemic hit because they were like, uh, we've been doing this even before the pandemic. And um, I've been somehow frustrated uh, with the industry here in Europe because it's, you know, Europe, it's a very um, traditional, traditional place, I think. And I always like to say all the wild people back in the days left for America or for somewhere else for the Americas, <laughs> just the more com most comfortable one uh, stayed here. And um, and it's really nice when I when I see that there are some uh, offices in the industry that are more open for this new um, for this new way of networking. As I, I see it as a network that. It's like a spider net that sometimes connect on more points and sometimes on 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 less. Um, and you mentioned you work also on international level. You collaborate with an international international network of architects. Um, one one thing when they when they released um, when when they opened the photo book, I read I don't remember where on some of those architecture magazines when I was as I said stalking you digitally. Uh, they were saying yeah this is the moment where um, Michel Roykind need to decide if he's going to stay in Mexico or go uh, international, do a project outside of Mexico, which for me was not so relevant because it doesn't matter where the project is. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I was exactly. curious, what are the other, what are, for example, other world, worldwide offices that you have collaborated with? Uh, I mean, I've seen Bjorke, but are, are there any others? Yeah, we're actually finishing a, a project now. It's, it's going to be my first project in the United States in Bentonville in Arkansas. And the building is called The Ledger that you can go on the website if you put The, the Ledger Bentonville. And um, uh, because it's in Bentonville, Arkansas. And it's with uh, Marlon Blackwell, uh, who's uh, Marlon Blackwell is a, a super well-known architect, a great colleague. And also with um, with uh, Christian Callahan and... and, and, and um, uh, he, he just opened up a, 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 um, an office with a, with his partner as well, um, and and they're doing amazing work. Um, Haruka, Haruka and Christian, they have the, this office. So it's a it's a three three part uh, team composed to do this building, and um, and that's opening up by the end of the year. And it's it's a, you, you'll see it's a it's a bikeable building. You actually can use your bike to, it's an office building, but you can bike your way up to the sixth floor. And um, we also had this beautiful opportunity to invite Stefan Sagmeister as a designer to put some, um, a piece of art in the ramps while you're going up the building. So uh, that's, that's one example of something that's just um, about to uh, open uh, by the end of the year. So you'll see many pictures of that building. Um, we're doing a couple of houses also with Christian and Haruka in um, also in Bentonville, so private residences for for a client that wants to speculate with more modern uh, architecture for for younger couples moving into Bentonville and 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 so so it's happening. I mean, we we won a competition that's on standby for uh, for a welcome center, but uh, but again, I mean, things that are moving slower than I thought, but I would. For people saying that if now after Foroboka I would be an international architect, I've always said that I'm an, inter an international architect working in Mexico. So this is my base, and I can work from from Mexico to any part of the world where you where you partner with a local architect. But uh, I I wouldn't see myself as oh now I'm leaving Mexico. Why would I want to leave Mexico? This is it's a beautiful country and a beautiful place, and my daughter is here, and I have like a if any opportunities happen abroad, of course you. You team up with the local architect. That's, that's the beauty of flexibility, and that's the beauty of what the pandemic has shown us, no, hey, Georgie? That that uh, the way we're collaborating now is even just just made it, uh, it. It's it's made clearer that we can work from any place to anywhere as well, no. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and and my point was that it doesn't matter where is the building, as soon as it's a great building or it's an interesting project. Um, and one thing that I'm like, what I really, well, as I said, what for me was very interesting about you, it was, um, of course the architectural work, but it's also, um, all the, the, 
the figure that that you are that it's multi facets uh, um, and um what what we are taught as architects and designer in in university is mainly how to design how to do a great design and when you come out of there it seems almost like if you know to design in a in a good way uh, then you're gonna get a, a project and you're gonna be successful and uh, and then it sounds like a, a, as easy as as that um what in your opinion it's uh, something um so what are the others very important skills for example for a designer for an architect to to get projects and to to get out there of course in the architecture world we have competitions but they're like more or less a bet so <laughs> if you if you if you say networking or something similar well for, for, first of all i have to say that 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 you build architecture with with words, with ideas, with concepts. So, so I mean, not not only with bricks and and and, and, and concrete and steel. No, so I'm always uh, telling my students and people, no, I mean, be have an opinion, have an opinion on things because that builds a career. Having an opinion on on different aspects of things that are going on on our daily lives creates concepts, creates ideas that, that then you can manifest them in, in the built environment that becomes your architecture. But, but you're always build, we're always building ourselves, no? Um, it's, it's important to acknowledge that, that um, again, uh, your background is super important. So, for instance, we just had Francis Carrer winning the Pritzker Prize. And if you hear his conversations, it's beautiful how he says, how he's bringing his background into the architecture that he does and bringing it to the West and understanding the difference of, of his, his uh, elements back home. I think that one of the biggest mistakes that an architect can do is just to mimic uh, if he moves to another country, becoming an American architect because you move to the States. No, it's like, just bring your background and bring the way people will hire you because you see things in a different way. Not only because you have great skills, but they want to see, a little bit of the persp- of, of how you how are you seeing the world through your eyes no and how it's filtered through in my case this mexican that that was a musician before and and, and is an architect and what what, is, what does that do to the way i can project architecture and they come to us asking all these questions like what can we do with this project that that i want to hire you as the architect to design for so so i think that yes i I've, I've had amazing talented people come to the office but not curious enough georgie so they're super talented in a skill that maybe they're great at 3d modeling but they're not curious at all and i'm like what what happens to your curiosity if you're not curious there is no growth no so you can be technically skilled to do something but i'd rather have people that are curious in my office i'd rather have people that are questioning themselves and asking like could we do this could we maybe go uh, look for this guy uh, can we look for this material? Can we find this resource? Can we uh, figure out if by doing this, we can maybe make somebody else responsible to understand how to create more impact or social impact with our building? So that's the kind, the type of office I, I, I have and the type of office I love having. So whenever somebody knows that he's too talented or he knows too much of himself to do something, sometimes that's not the best um, a person for the office. Uh, definitely, no? So... So I think that, again, coming back to what's important, your background is important. Bringing, that's why I'm, I'm super interested in, in, in reading more and seeing movies and going with my friends that are DJs and understanding more about life in general and understanding how communities are evolving because that's where you're going to be projecting your next buildings, no? To that society, that if you don't know how they... Uh, communicate how they party how they eat how they what they do how are you going to be a good designer no if you're not understanding what are the updates of of society in a way that the pandemic hits and affects and the way uh, because with the pandemic we sort of uh, suddenly realized first of all the importance of a house because not all of us were lucky enough to have a house so it, having a house um uh, was a privilege or is a, is a privilege and understanding that if you're privileged enough to have a house during the pandemic, how can you help others? No, how can you be of service to others? Not only thinking of your profession as an architect. So a lot of things have changed and are still changing now with the war. And uh, so 
if you don't become a thermometer of all these things happening around you to understand, uh, because being a modern architect doesn't mean just doing a modern building. It means building a modern space for a modern society and for a way of understanding how we need to deal with the things that are happening around us. No, so so I, I'm more curious about how do you how do we create that impact? How do we give uh, cities generous buildings that give back to the community? How do we make sure that in our buildings there is um, a recognition of of diversity, a recognition of inclusion, and and, and how do you do spaces that invite people to come into the the, the 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 projects that we do, even if they don't enter the building, but they just want to be around the building. Also, I mean, there's a lot of things that that I, I come into play, but I would definitely say that to me, one of the most important is where you come from. What's your background? How were you brought up? No, and that that really makes it resonates. And if you see, uh, again, coming back to uh, why people select one architect rather than the other is because you're true to to where you come from. And is your is your team, which is you said it's quite small, um, also international? Because through through the research, I, I happen to to get to see that some of your em employees, or I don't know if they are former employees now, have started also this platform uh, design. Uh, Think parametric or something like that because also in your office you use a lot of parametric design is it a very international office where there are people with different backgrounds that bring exactly what you were saying this different uh understanding of of life because for me also i have personally i'm lucky that i have a personal within a very international background because i was in, born in bulgaria i grew up in italy and uh, now I'm um, seven years ago i might say now but it's seven years ago i moved to germany so i have seen three different cultures and I understand that it's very different how people live. Um, so is your team international? Yes, it is. It has been and it will always be because I think that by having an international team, now there's a couple of um, people from Argentina, for example. So, so what is happening in Argentina or what is happening in Europe or what is happening in America? No? And, uh, and it's interesting because then the conversations Yes, they are about architecture, but they're more about the way we relate to our society, the way that uh, what happened in your country during the pandemic, uh, uh, what has happened here in Mexico. For instance, Mexico, Mexico became like this incredible place to visit because you're not required to show your vaccine here. So everybody from Australia to uh, Europe to uh, uh, Central America, South America, they, they, they came to, uh, they're coming to Mexico, no? I mean, uh, Because, because they, they're seeing that the freedom that you have here compared to other cities that they're on lockdown or they're still in certain restrictions, um, here they just have this sense of freedom. So, so again, anything that, uh, that's why I'm always uh, in favor of, I mean, having the more diverse groups that you have, the more people from different parts, the more different cultures you have within your office, the more, the richer the conversations. No, it's going to be more, more about, oh, uh, help me understand how, how things happen in your country because I don't see them that way or I haven't been able to, to understand them completely in that sense. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I on purpose, uh, work with a lot of uh, international designers that, that bring a lot of uh, uh, things to the office. For instance, these guys from Think Parametric, they're Mexican, but they've done a great job, no? Uh, um, doing their, uh, helping people uh, advance on their skills and become better at the projects that they're doing. And, and I think they're doing a, a great job. And I was happy. I was really lucky enough to have them be part of the office in certain periods. And we're still looking for ways to collaborate. So, so again, it's your, your network that to me, it's like your family. No, you keep your family close. So people that work with us, uh, uh, we tend to keep asking them like, how are they doing in, in life in general? What projects are they getting? And, and just good to have them close. No? And um, do you get um, also from within the community like um, that happens a lot, especially in uh, in in other countries in Italy where I've studied. For example, I don't know. I make an example. Stefano Bueri did um, the Bosco Verticale, if you know this uh, skyscraper in Milan, which is with all the trees. 
and um, it was really cool and we students loved it and our professor sometimes would say to us in the design class uh, this is nothing else but a skyscraper with vases and I hated that because I was like okay it's a skyscraper with vases but why didn't you do it if it was so cool to do and 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 you didn't come with the idea to put vases on the skyscraper Um, (laughs) and your projects are also outside of 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 the what is considered to be like the classic way of doing architecture do you get also a lot of um, some let's call it hate or a lot of like um, yeah not positive uh, 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 review from from the Mexican architectural community or from from uh, yeah from some of the circles in the architecture yeah I mean uh, it always happens but uh, um, I had some hard critics when I was doing the National Film Institute, the Cineteca Nacional, uh, because that was a very big project. That was a government project. So so a lot of architects wanted it. So a lot of them were hitting me like, why him? No, why? He used to be a musician. Why him? No, or why not give it to this other guy? Or, or when I started, when we started presenting the ideas for the project that I, this is a beautiful space in Mexico, but it was a it was a parking garage with with the with the film theaters. So the first thing that I proposed is to take the cars out of the plaza, to create a garden plaza and to create a sort of campus effect for the building. Uh, so that way, I, I proposed to have a parking garage at the at the entrance of the project to keep the cars out. And and our other architects were like, "Oh, this crazy architect is spending money on a parking garage when the commission was to do a the best cinemateca in the world, and he's spending money on the things he shouldn't." But years later, if you see the project now, people love to hang out there. They, there's a lot of people that just go to have a coffee or to read a book or to see a theater, a, a play or something that's happening besides uh, the films that are happening on the inside of the venue. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's been criticism also because I don't come from a conservative background as many architects that did architecture, but then did their masters and then they did a PhD. So uh, it's 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 easy for, uh, for for people to criticize the, the way I've 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 lived my career, no, or I've done my career. I mean, to me, again, it's about life, no. It's about how you're changing in um, in the way you're doing things, and 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 I mean, we take the the work seriously, but we don't take ourselves too seriously, no. It's like you can't. Uh, if you're not in the process that you're learning and you're transforming yourself and you have to understand how to uh, be this thermometer uh, to, to really be able to tackle new, new projects with, with certain conditions, um, you would be doing the, I mean, I don't believe in, in architecture that's repetitive and that you do the same type of building everywhere as if clients were the same, as if budgets were the same. It's like that, that, that happened for a while, no? When architects, developed a, a style that they would repeat everywhere. And I'm like, why would you, I mean, how could you, maybe the craft is not even in that country. So how can you want, how do you want to repeat a craft that maybe in another country is twice as expensive to do because they, they don't have that craft in that country. So I think that's, that's some of the, the main, the, the main uh, things that changed. No? Yeah. Like if you have a certain style, then you'll be sort of a slave to the style and, and, uh, and I also am not a, I'm not a big fan of this. So you explained so far that you're very interested into social behavior, into cultural background, which is one drive for your design, which is very important, like social action, human activity. Um, would you say what is what are maybe other factors that are driving your design decisions? Because when, uh, when of course, when somebody goes to visit your works, they're very different from each other so if we take uh, Cineteca Nacional it's like this uh, this uh, actual volume but that looks very light and very perforated then we have uh, Foro Boca that for example I call it the, the flying stones because it looks like out of stone but the the actual the actual boxes are floating so, so they're very very different so when you when you do these projects how if you can Explain it to words. I know it's a very complex thing. There are many factors, but what is your way of thinking? What is your des- design philosophy? Well, well, first of all, it's again, as I was saying, George, you understanding there's a certain budget 
a certain time, a certain uh, geographical location. So if, if we don't do enough research to understand what's the local craft, we're not doing our job. If we don't understand what are the local virtues of the place we're going to do our building, and even the way to build certain architecture, we cannot come in and impose a certain type of architecture, no? So, so we like the idea of doing enough research before and understanding, for instance, when we got to Foro Boca, it was very clear that we needed to do just one or two materials, no? We're sitting on the sand, we're sitting on the beach in a place where you get hit by the worst north winds and hurricanes. And we said, okay, if we do something made of glass, that's the wrong solution. We can't do something made of glass because it's not going to work. If we use metal, it's going to rust. So let's, let's figure out how to do something in concrete that really becomes resistant to the weather, that becomes something that looks like it came out of from, from the place. No, So, I mean, there, there's, there's, I think that if we don't respond to the certain conditions, we're not doing our job. We're being too egoistic to just plant uh, the same style of architecture over and over and over. No, it's like, like um, I would remember uh, seeing uh, Frank Gehry talking about his work and, and, and him being bored that everybody asked him for another Guggenheim. No, he was like, I don't want to do more Guggenheims. I want to do more stuff and experiment and do the different things because um, again, it's understanding the culture. That's why. That's why I love one of the firms that I enjoy the most. Georgie is uh, her second demo. Oh, no, Jack and Pierre. I mean, Jack and Pierre. They're they're in, incredibly savvy at doing that. No, specifically at coming at seeing who's the local craftsman, who are the local artists, what's the community about, and just uh, coming back and saying, "This is this is your your tailor made suit." No, I mean it's it's something specifically styled for you. And yes, it's going to be more work because you don't have 300 details of your previous work that you can just copy paste and put them in the new project. Uh, but the outcome is going to be worth the effort because uh, you're presenting something that is new for, for every client, no? And, um, and coming back to even to Stefano uh, Boeri, I think that now when Stefani did Bosco Verticale in, in Milan, now everybody wants him to do Bosco Verticale. So, so now he's... Uh, he has to be very careful of, of not becoming the architect that only uh, puts uh, has the green buildings. No, it's like, and, and he's an amazing architect. I, I I love I love his work, and I've been friends with him for a long time. But it's like that. You have to be careful that. I mean, people of course uh, were asking us to do uh, other cinetecas for other projects that that they wanted them to look like cinetec, and I said no. That that's for the National Film Institute, no. Or if somebody would come in and say like, could you do a project like Foro Boca? Well, Foro Boca was designed to be in Veracruz in this specific place. So, so I, I wouldn't know the outcome of a different project until I have the site and I know the local conditions. No? And, and, and again, how to create impact to that, to that community. Because, for instance, Foro Boca is more about the wave breaker outside. No? It has these plazas on the outside. So it's a building for, even when it's closed, it invites people to come to the plaza and to enjoy the plaza. And you see... Uh, uh, this group of yoga teachers doing yoga in the mornings and you see the fishermen coming to the place and, um, and in Cineteca uh, it's open to the public no? so, so you have a green space that again if there's no movies you can go and read a book and just have a, uh, an experience on the outside of the building so each of them attend, attend to a different way of giving back to the community were there projects where you needed to say like, um, no, I'm dropping this one because I really am not in the condition to do the work I want to do and that I, I, I stand for? Like, because sometimes, as you said, maybe clients can get very, very expecting you to do exactly what they want. And um, sometimes we say at the office, it's like uh, going to the doctor, you know, and discuss if the doctor should give you this medicament or the other thing and with architects happens a lot of times you know like that they say no you need to do it this and that way and it's where is this where there are moments where really it was very very hard after you start a project said look no, i cannot do this um so what one project that just happened a couple of weeks ago and i'm, I'm uh, i like to share because i was actually sitting down with my daughter 
And um, this this woman, a very important woman here from Mexico, came 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 up to us saying, "Oh, there are no coincidences in life. Uh, seeing you here, I have the perfect project for you. You're going to help us do the best project um, for this specific location." I said, "Oh, perfect! I, thank you for the invitation. So, what what is the project?" And she said, "We're going to do the world's best aquarium in the world, and it's going to be in this location." And I immediately told her, oh, thanks for the invitation, but I, I, I don't want to be an architect doing an aquarium. I don't believe in aquariums. And, and, and with everything that's going on in the world, I don't believe in trapping animals and putting them in these acrylic uh, uh, environments, no? So, uh, so she immediately said, well, what, what would you do? And I said, well, back in the day, speaking to Biarque, we, we proposed an aquarium where where you would come to a visitor center that would be on land and that visitor center would tell you all the information about the fishes and, and the, 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 the marine life, plants and, 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 and animals and everything. But then you would have an acrylic tunnel go inside the water for various kilometers and the person within the acrylic cage would be humans. So you as a human would be exploring the ocean and you would, and you would tell this research center to invest on, on feeding and, uh, and, and planting more corals to have more diversity come to you. But you would actually change the way we're doing things today. Why do we have to keep on caging animals or doing, and if we want to show them, go to the water and do an aquarium where you are the one inside this acrylic uh, element. So, so I mean, I, that, that was a fun conversation even with my daughter because I said, it's not all about the money. I know I could have maybe taken the commission, Georgie, and, 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 and earned a lot of money because it was a super well-paid project. It was a super big project. And it, it didn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. And especially, again, with the pandemic where, where we have to think for ourselves, are we part of the problem or are we part of the solution? Are we being responsible for things that are happening in the world today and the type of world that we have? And I think that that is being honest and, and being accountable for the things that we've done. No? So that's one of the projects that I had to say no. And I, and I feel very comfortable having said no to. No? And um, I've seen that you've recently have become part of this uh, sort of new project or new, um, new office, which is called Naya, uh, which is a little bit more reflecting, I think, your personal values. Uh, I, I've uh, a little bit uh, flew through the information, but can you explain me more what is that about? Because this is something that uh, um, seems uh, seems to be a, a new endeavor for you. Uh, no, no. So, so Naya, it, it's a it's a group of very interesting people coming together, and also, uh, um, I mean, we wanna we wanna. Uh, understand how to build true community power we want to understand how i mean um, share wealth how this holistic well-being um, for minoritized uh, people or communities we want to be able to help we're, we're in a moment where we're coming together as a as a, as a group of people um, it, first of all uh, miguel after coming out of uh, we work no uh, this is one of his uh, his new endeavors and he's investing in in companies that, that pr represent um, things that change systemic wrongs, Georgie. And what I mean by that is like, how do we change again, things that in the system we know are, are, are not well, are not good, no? So um, there's a couple of companies that he's, he's supporting and he's uh, investing in, and we're gonna have a, a design office. So um, I'm actually now interviewing a couple of people because we're gonna open up a design office in London. So also, if it's somebody in your radar, Georgie, uh, you know of uh, that could be interested in working with us in Naya, uh, I need to start the office in London with Miguel. So uh, if, if we remember, Miguel um, is an architect before joining WeWork, and he was working at uh, American Apparel and doing all the stores, but he, he's a great uh, thinker and designer. So we're going to explore more how to do architecture with more with more social impact, no? How can we create uh, not only architecture for, for design's sake, but it's like, how can we do something that, again, becomes these platforms for 
for fixing systemic wrongs that we know can, can be changed. No? Not only, um, again, for minorities, but also sustainability issues. Because when we talk about sustainability, it's funny. We say, why do we keep on talking about sustainability if there's nothing to sustain? I mean, if we wanted to sustain the current model, it would collapse, no? So we need to talk about regenerative models and we need to talk about uh, things to do that really work on, on not only the idea of leave no trace, but leave it better. I mean, not only the way, if you're gonna do something, make it count, make it count that while you're there, it does create something that, that makes the community better. So um, I'm super proud of, of, of Naya coming out and it's a, it's a baby company still, but you'll see, you'll see many, many good things happening around it, no? And, uh, it, and some of them might not only be about architecture, so that, that's the fun part of it. We're gonna be creating things that, that uh, as long as it helps, as long as it pushes the envelope to, to have the right conversations with the right people, we're gonna be very happy about the results, no? For sure. I'll be sharing the news uh, because, uh, I mean, of course, now also through the networking, through the podcast, I know a lot of people around the world but I think currently with um, in London, it has to be more like uh, it would be better if there are more local people because uh, with Brexit, there are a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of taxes for people coming from abroad. So if, yeah, and a lot of Europeans out of principle don't want to go to, to London currently. It's a very it's a very strange time we're living in. But I want to move on a subject that is also for me very personal. Uh, one thing that when I when I'm scrolling through social media and see your Instagram account makes me feel very bad is that you go to run <laughs> every day at six in the morning and I don't and um, and uh, I've it's so funny because I've been like uh, watching uh, again when I interview somebody that's. Uh, more popular let's say i have to watch some of their stuff because i want to try to ask different questions and not uh, only ask you what everybody's asking um how did you start because 10 years ago you weren't so fit as you are now so <laughs> i'm really curious how this running uh, running um habit you start you started well i mean one of the, the most important things at least to me georgie is that I cannot, it, it's difficult to separate one thing from the other. There, there came a point where even having conversations with creative people like, oh, okay, now I'm wearing the suit of the architect. So now I have to behave as the architect. Like, but you're this human being having this experience. And it's a, it's a whole experience where I'm an architect, I'm a runner, I'm a musician, I'm a father, I'm a friend. I mean, I'm, I'm all these things. And, and understanding that, that your practice is not 7 to 8 a.m. yoga, no? and your practice is not a 20-minute meditation. Your practice is your life. And having consistency on having a practice of your life that becomes more coherent to the things of, that you do with who you are, to me, makes a lot of sense. So um, uh, taking care of my body and taking care of me in this short trip or long trip or whatever, how, however long um, I live in this planet, it's like you have to take care of this body that you're given, no? And 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 being aware of that, the the time I put into that by running or by eating uh, properly just makes me connect a bit more and make, makes me a bit more aware. Um, running is a way of uh, again having clarity. I mean, I if I have a, a difficult meeting, I would love to. I love going in the morning to run because I just come back to the meeting and my head is really focused on what I need to focus on because it's like a personal checkup. You know, you're, you're running and you're seeing how your mind is and how your body is and how your energy is. So, so it's a way of being first grateful for having this experience in your life of, of being able to go out and run because, of course, if, you're not, if you don't have the health and, um, to do it, you won't be running. You know? So first of all, appreciating that you're, uh, again, thankful for having health to be able to go out and run. And, um, but the funny thing, uh, uh, just how I started running, uh, I've done exercise all my life, Georgie, but, uh, but running wasn't something that I really enjoyed. I didn't like running too much. But as an architect, I would, I would take my running shoes in my bag. And if I arrived in, in Milan, for instance, um, the moment I arrived by, by plane and the next morning, I would, I would get out and run and do a 10-kilometer run around the city. And um, in those 10K, I would recognize north, south, east, west, the parks, 
because running has this beautiful connection of human scale towards the city where you're not fast enough to be distracted. Like when you're on a bike or a motorcycle, you're also not in a car, but also I love running at five 30 in the morning or six. So you're seeing the city wake up. So it's also a beautiful experience of, of, of collecting these memories of cities at five 36 in the morning where it gives you a sense of orientation. So I started doing 10 kilometer races and then a friend of mine told me to run a marathon, which I thought he was crazy. I said, no way. Why would I run a marathon? I'm not interested in running a marathon. And um, he convinced me to do it with my, with my ex-partner. And uh, we went a, a couple of, uh, first of all, it was a, like a, this friendship thing where we said, okay, let's go run San Francisco, run the marathon, and then let's go to Napa Valley with our wives and our girlfriends or whoever was there at the time and, and just enjoy some wine after. So it became an experience not just the running, which running is, 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 is kind of the, uh, the methodology to have this other thing in your life. No, I mean, the benefits of running to me is what, what makes it totally uh, worthwhile. But again, it's just, it's, it's a way of, of me connecting to myself and, and, and clearing your hard drive, as I would say, or clearing things that happen within you that you don't want to hold on to. So, um, I love I love sharing that because that's that's a part of me as well. No, I have friends that always joke with me like, "Oh, I get tired of seeing your Instagram because you run so much in the morning that I feel that I was the one who was doing the exercise." No, but uh, I, I I think that we we all we all have our ways of um, of um, of trying to be better at what we do. No, and and again, the, the people that I admire the most are the ones that are more coherent to who they are how they show up in the world and how they do their work. No? Right? That's, that's a, kind of a beautiful lesson for me. Yeah. It's, it's important to be like yourself in everything you do. Otherwise people, when they see a disconnection between maybe what you do and what you say, it's, um, it, it, it creates, it, it, it has this wrong, uh, wrong feedback. And so you started with running and then that add on on this, like also specific eating, um, eating behavior, diet, something that build up to the marathon. I, I think you have also a trainer in, in this year, you completed the Boston marathon too. So congrats. So, well, it's a very interesting journey. I thought it was something that happened for some reason. I mean, it, it's been, a. Um... I mean, you also, I mean, you, there's also something about accepting your age and accepting the way that we're growing older in, in life. And it's great. And I love the idea of, I always uh, joke and have a hashtag that says, grow young. Why should we grow old? Let's grow young, no? <laughs> and growing young is like, I mean, I want to. I want to be able to run until I can, no, until my knees uh, can, can, can get me running. Um, uh, I, I feel definitely the benefits of being more active, no, and, 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 and being more energized because at some point when I don't go running, I feel, uh, it's funny because when you do exercise, at the beginning you feel tired when you exercise. But then uh, when you have that in a constant way in your life, the day you don't do exercise is when you feel tired because it's like, oh, something something did not uh, activate the, the the machine or the uh, the, the the power within you, you know but uh but uh, I, I just love it and i love finding ways to uh, i mean i'm running the new york marathon this year and um so i, I wanted to enter the tokyo marathon but couldn't find a way to, to get in because of how many people are are um on hold of uh, for, for the previous years no because of the pandemic but I want to keep, I want to run as much as I can. I don't want to leave that because it, it, it does become a therapy. It becomes my, my therapist and it becomes my, my way of, of really understanding how to relate to the other things. No, that gives me peace of mind. If I don't go running, my daughter will make sure that I just go out of the house and go for a run because she said, dad, you need to run now out. <laughs> she wants you out of there. No, that's a fun thing. I, I, I suggest you, I've uh, read the book recently. It's called Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have to. It's, it's a book uh, from this Harvard professor, I think, uh, in medical science who explains how aging is like, a, um, it's like a disease and you can prevent it. You know, there are certain practices you can do 
uh, to put yourself on stress, as you said, to, uh, which is good stress, bad stress. And it's a very interesting book uh, and I think would be very interesting to you. Um, well, I, I and talk in talking, yeah. No, I'll put it on the chat so I can have it. No, I, I, if you can write it there on the chat, uh, I, I'll put it. I, in. I, I'm gonna go get it as soon as possible. I'll put yeah, it. Put you it can also uh, get it. I, I've what I do is sometimes because there are so many books that I like to read. Um, I certain books uh, I download in the audio form. And also when I, because we bike a lot here in Frankfurt to move around, uh, when I bike somewhere or when I cook, I have a, a, bo a book. And uh, for example, I've read, I've listened to the one from Matthew McConaughey, and I think it's nicer to have it as an audiobook because he reads it. So he, oh. he, his voice is very artistic. And, and um, this is how I always like to conclude every interview to finish it. Um, uh, with a positive note, I call it the tool, toolbox of inspirations. And I ask every guest if they can share some uh, something that uh, inspires them when they're when they're a little bit low on batteries. If it's a, a podcast, music, book, movie, uh, whatever you f what whatever is yours. Uh, I mean, oof, I, have, I have a couple of things. First of all, because I'm a musician, music will always uplift me. No, or sometimes even prepare the right mood because sometimes when you're down, it doesn't mean that you want to feel uh, perky and, and, and climb back up and feel um, ignited. Sometimes when you're melancholic, it's nice to kind of just be in that mood and accept it and, and go through that stage of why are you feeling mel melancholic? Or, but I think music is a, is a perfect tool for that. So I, I normally create pod, uh, playlists. So there's a couple of playlists in, in my uh, Spotify account, which I'll share with you, Georgie. So, so, People can, can I mean, it, it, right now it's a mess. There's many playlists, but I need to clean it up. Uh, but uh, there's some good playlists there, depending on the mood that you're in. But um, but definitely, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, mu music or some sport. I mean, just go doing something that 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 is do with yourself. I mean, uh, as you were mentioning. I mean, reading books, there's some great books that I can recommend. There's one that, that if you want to uh, read something about letting go and about surrendering, it's called The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. And it's a beautiful book because it's also about like how many things we want to control and, and want to grasp. And sometimes it's like pay attention to the way you want to control things and just do the surrender experiment. Surrender to that opportunity to not try to control it, no? which I think is... Is, is, is stuff that we need to learn, but uh, eh, but first of all, I think that 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 it's very important for us to understand what is our process. You no, know? what are we learning? Are we growing in that process or not? And uh, and um, so, I mean, get inspired by. I, I love film as well. So so eh, I have my my best film directors and movies and but um, I mean Wes Anderson is one of my favorite filmmakers and. Uh, but I, but I love seeing. I mean, I was seeing Euphoria, the the TV show, because my daughter was was into it, and I want to had I wanted to have a conversation with her that was around that. So I I just love seeing new things to again understand your What are the new generations thinking about? How are they producing new materials? What are the new style of filmmaking? What's the new style of creating music? No, and um and just maintaining maintaining being kind of informed of what's going on it sounds it sounds a great way to to end up the the conversation um i'm i'm i was impressed before getting to know you now i'm even more convinced of my positive opinion for of you <laughs> before getting to to talk to you oh. um michelle thank you very much i'll be sharing all the things that we talk about thank in you, in in the links of of this conversation and uh, I always say to every guest, this is the first time that you're on the podcast, but of course it doesn't have to be the last one because every guest, it's like a brick that makes it grow. And I'll be happy to share you with you, you this platform when it's even, even bigger. So thank you very much. Perfect, uh, my friend. Thank you very much.